I'm John McKernan, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. And we've heard a lot of great speakers uh, today about the importance of youth employment. We have two people here today on the panel who are going to maintain that trend. Great speakers about the importance of, uh, of youth employment. And they're going to have a different perspective. They're going to be talking about how they have integrated their youth employment strategies into their business strategies. And if you think about it, that's important because we are not going to have employees if we don't have employers. And that means employers engage in making sure that more young people have opportunity. And it's a topic that's very important uh, to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. We understand that the impact of disconnected youth on the economy and on society's overall well-being uh, is significant. And if we are to effectively address the skills gaps that we've been talking about today, businesses cannot ignore the unemployment crisis that we have affecting young people uh, in uh, American society. We want America's economy to grow. We want businesses to prosper. We want them to be competitive. And we want to make sure that youth have an opportunity for success. And that's why our foundation is addressing uh, this issue. We are enc encouraging businesses to engage in this issue and to lead long-term employer-driven solutions to help businesses build and support a youth talent pipeline. And as part of this first phase of the work, we're releasing a white paper today, and I think you may have seen some of these. If not, they'll be available at the end of, at the, end of the session. Don't ask me why it's a white paper with a blue cover, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's uh, the, way, uh, the way the system works. But uh, it's an important document because what it's going to do is give businesses the opportunity to understand how they can become more involved uh, in this issue. It's called Making Youth Employment Work. It details five essential elements, five essential elements that are necessary to create a successful demand-driven youth talent pipeline strategy. And that's what's going to underline the next phase of our work, where we are going to uh, look at ways that we can implement demand-driven approaches to youth employment in three different communities across the nation and look for the best approaches that we can scale to take uh, advantage of the opportunities of business involvement. So as I said, I'm, I'm joined today by two uh, uh, really key figures because uh, they get it. They understand the importance of, uh, of youth employment and how businesses can play such an important role in a way that is not only going to enhance youth employment, but enhance opportunities in their own businesses. And that's the connection uh, that we have to make. We were talking backstage, and I was kidding them that uh, you know, we featured them in our white paper, which is why they're, they're here, because we know of the good work that they're doing. But you couldn't have two industries that are farther apart. You have one that is in, pre is in precision manufacturing and another one in marketing and consulting. But it demonstrates the breadth of the need, the breadth of the issue that is affecting both the young people as well as, uh, as employers uh, in our society today. So let me introduce uh, Darlene Miller, who's sitting uh, next to me. She is the president and CEO of Permac Industries, as you heard, which is a global leader in the preci precision machining industry. Next to her is Danny Vargas. Danny is the president and founder of Varcom Solutions, and it's a nationally recognized marketing communications, technology, and management consulting firm. So you can see, uh, you have one that is uh, there's in the service industry, one in the manufacturing sector, and yet they both are looking to solve an issue that affects both young people in this country as well as their own, uh, as their own companies. So I want to start uh, with, uh, with Darlene. And I think we, uh, we sort of all agree that uh, youth can have a big impact in high growth fields uh, where companies are growing and are dramatically feeling the effect of the skills gap that we've been talking about here today. Manufacturing is one of those industries, especially as it relates to the middle skills gap uh, that is particularly dire uh, in manufacturing. But uh, Darlene has taken the lead. She's really understood how to address uh, uh, this situation that manufacturing is involved in. So I thought maybe that would be a good place to start to just uh, let us know the kind of good things that you're involved in. Okay. Good afternoon. Well, there's no doubt there's tons of opportunity um, in any of the high growth fields, and especially in manufacturing, 
not just because we're growing, but because of the baby boomers, as we all know and have heard so much today. I think there's 10,000 a day reaching the age of 65 over the next 18 years. So we really need people to refill those spots. And I wish I could say that robots would do all this work, but we'd have no creativity, no innovativeness. We need the youth to provide that for us. But I'd like to leave a message, and that's if our youth could go back and learn the math skills that we require and the literacy skills, because we're finding that that's where the talent is being missed in the high schools, and we really need to get back into that. And I think we also need to really change the way we do this. We small businesses and mid-sized businesses have to really get engaged. It's easy for the big guys to do it, but we can do it too. We can be active in our own communities, we can speak at the high schools, we can open our doors on manufacturing day, we can encourage the teachers to come in and see what we're doing, bring parents in. Mothers are kind of our worst enemies in manufacturing because they say, no, my child is gonna go to college instead of a good career in manufacturing. So we need them to see that our places are bright and clean, cheery, and that these kids are gonna be involved in computers on our million dollar machines, and that they're gonna have a great successful career. So I really feel small business and mid-sized business also really has to take the lead. And then it becomes a win-win-win for everyone. It's winning for the youth, it's winning for our schools because if we get involved with our schools and tell them what we need and what they should teach, they're gonna graduate more students. And of course, it's a huge win for us because we are going to have employees. And there could be a fourth win for all of you parents who have a child living in your basement who <laughs> is, is working a minimum age job or could now uh, make a difference and be able to move out on their own. So we have jobs, we have great jobs, we pay great benefits, and it's not just machinists. We have so many different positions from purchasing to shipping to engineering to drafting. Um, there's just so many different positions that we need to fill and are constantly looking for quality people. So there's lots of jobs to be had. We just need to get people to work together in partnership to make this happen. Speaking of working together, I mean, let's, let's talk to Danny about uh, the uh, marketing and consulting business and the way that's changed, and especially the impact of technology, even in, in that service industry, and what that means in terms of uh, your ability to attract young people and the difference they make in, in filling uh, critical positions for you, even in an industry that people don't think of as requiring those kind of technical skills. It's an excellent point. I mean, the, the world has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. The way that we communicate, the way that we engage, the way that we share information has changed significantly over the last 20 years. Uh, I'll give you a couple of data points. Uh, we, in November, we reached the point where in this planet, three billion people are now accessing the internet. In September, we reached the point where there are 3.6 billion mobile users. That's 50% of the world's population. We are now a much more connected world than we have ever been, and that trend will only continue. The folks that are communicating are also different too. We are a much more diverse society than we used to be. So we have to be able to make sure that we are able to leverage all of the forms of communication, all the forms of technology to be able to engage and communicate and inspire, uh, particularly young people. You know, it's interesting, I, I call the, the generation that's out there today, I call them Generation D, because they are the digital generation. They're no longer the folks that are the analog workforce of the past, they are now the digital workforce of today and tomorrow, and they're able to think differently than, than we do even, and our, our parents do. Has anybody ever seen like their grandparent trying to figure out Facebook? It's kind of comical, isn't it? <laughs> For young people today, a three-year-old can pick up a tablet and figure out how to use it within minutes. The world has changed. You know, someone who's turning 18 in the year 2015, was born in 1997. In 1997 was when we first saw AOL Instant Message. It was when we first saw Hotmail. It's when we first used the term blogging. 
1997. The year later was when Google was launched. So the people that are turning 18 this year have never, ever seen a day without technology being at the forefront of virtually everything that we do in terms of the way we communicate. So that's something that's essential, and that's only going to continue to change. So young people are vital to making sure that, particularly in my industry, in the communications world, that we need to make sure that they remain engaged and leading and not just waiting for the world to follow. They need to be the leaders of the world. You know, let me just stick with, with Danny for a minute. One of the frustrations that I've always had is that um, we're having a hard time with the whole uh, youth employment movement, I think, in taking it in the business community from a philanthropic activity right. to part of an integrated business strategy that benefits the business. And you've been successful at that. Maybe it's because you realize you need the skills of, of, of young people and that's uh, allowed you to, to make that connection. But what advice do you have for either people here who are from the business community, people uh, who are engaging the business community to try to get more opportunities uh, sure. for young people on how do you take the, the, the youth employment strategy and integrate it into the, uh, the business strategy? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. There, there was a time not that long ago was I, I was a little bit concerned. I was worried that this generation was sort of a, the, you know, hand them a trophy for just showing up generation. You know, they thought, they thought it was all about just feeling good, and it was sort of the spoiled generation. I found that that's not necessarily the case. I found that many of them understand the fact that uh, good enough is not enough. I think that they've understood that it's not enough to, to go through school and get their education. They understand that it is today. It's no longer K through 12 or higher ed, now it's K through infinity. They have to be engaged in lifelong learning. Uh, I think they understand the fact that now we've gotten to the point where many of them have lived through the Great Recession, and that's given them some grit, that's given them some tenacity, some, some uh, toughness to them. I think we need to be able to leverage that. These folks are, the young people today have a level of flexibility and adaptability that many of our generation and the previous generations never had to deal with. Many folks in, in our generation and previous generations were able to go to a job and stay there for many, many, many years, many, in many cases throughout their, their professional lifetime. Young people nowadays don't know that they will go through six to eight jobs throughout their professional career. And in every single job, they need to be flexible, adaptable, agile, and nimble to meet the needs of their employers and their customers. And they sort of get that almost in their DNA. And that's something we need to be able to leverage and take advantage of and make sure that we sort of inculcate that, that desire to learn and take risk in our young people. I think those are the young people that I hire, the young people that I work with. These are young people that inspire me uh, as well as my colleagues and my customers. So we all know that uh, businesses need young people, especially if they're going to uh, continue to uh, be relevant in this 21st century economy. Uh, the question, if you're in manufacturing, it would seem to me, Darlene, is do young people want to go into manufacturing? And so many people, when you first hear about the idea of hiring young people uh, in manufacturing, is their concern is about safety and whether it's safe for youth to be involved in that kind of, uh, of an activity. What are the barriers that you've faced and, and what are the kind of things that you've done to try to make a precision manufacturing, in your case, um, more attractive to young people? And, and, and can, what advice can you give to people here? Well, again, I think safety is in everybody's mind every day, every place, no matter where you work. But the funny thing is safety creates a fear in us instead of an understanding. And just to give a little fact, there's a DART rate, which is the days away from work due to illness or injury. And in our industry, precision machining is 4.9. Uh, if the government is 4.2, the heavy fab uh, metals is 5.7. So in my industry, we're equally away from the, the heavy fab as we are from the government. So would you say it's safer to work for the government? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it just proves that we are a safe place. And I'm a mom, and my son has worked for me for 20 years. Would I put my son in harm's way? My grandson is going to work for me this summer. Our shops are bright, clean, spotless. You could almost beat off the floors. But the problem is, again, the perception. So we, again, have to get these people in 
and show them what we're all about, especially the counselors and the parents um, and the school teachers so that they see what we're all about. The other thing is we absolutely manage risk every day. And for example, I belong to our National Precision Machining Association, and we actually had Dr. Michael come in and speak to our group. He's the director of OSHA. Now, if we were really putting people at risk in our business, do you think we'd ask the director of OSHA <laughs> and give them all our names and numbers and addresses? <laughs> I don't think so. And besides, we're in the business of making parts to make your life better. We make parts for air, airspace, for air, uh, aerospace, for the planes you fly in, for the food that you eat. So we certainly would never put any of our people in harm's way. They're our biggest asset. Well, I know that um, uh, for all of your efforts, you have found it difficult at times to, uh, to find new uh, young employees in particular. Tell us about Right Skills uh, Now that, that you started, because I think that, that was an intriguing way, and, and I think it's instructive for others. Well, Right Skills Now is a fast track training program with it's 24 weeks, and it really was a great collaboration between um, NAM, National Association of Manufacturing, NIMS, the credentialing, and ACT, along with a community college in Minnesota. I had actually co chaired the High Tech Education Committee for. Um, the Committee on Jobs and Competitiveness by, um, that Jeff Emmel chaired for President Obama. And through that association was able to create this program, which I'm really pleased to say is now in over 35 different areas. And from that collaboration was really the partnership. I mean, that was the key. And it was us again, businesses going out to the schools and saying, this is what we need. What you're teaching, we don't do anymore. We haven't done that for 20 years. This is the type of equipment we have. This is the kind of geometry skills we need, that type of thing. And the schools were really excited to collaborate with us because again, they're gonna graduate more students. They're gonna get those students placed. And I'm happy to say almost every student in these classes, I think it's a 98.9% .9 graduation rate have jobs before they graduate. So it's all about collaboration as we've heard about today. Now, I know that it was, uh, it w you got a lot of support from the community colleges you worked with in your home state. As you've taken it to other states, have you gotten that same kind of, of support? Once we sit down with the school and really go through the program and we have them talk to the other colleges, which really do, or community colleges or tech schools, and have them share their experiences, and that's the key, because they're talking together on their level. Now, Danny, let, let's go to you, because you have done so much with minority institutions and, uh, uh, and historically black colleges, and uh, you've, had, you've had such success. You might want to talk about that experience, because I know you found that it's been very beneficial. It, it's been wonderful. I think, you know, w one of the things that I, I, I support the Department of Energy's efforts to bring interns uh, into a summer internship program from uh, minority serving institutions from all over the country, and they're doing wonderful work. Uh, the other hat that I wear, in addition to a business owner, is the fact that I, I chair the workforce board for the Great Commonwealth of Virginia. That's given us the opportunity to interact with localities throughout the state, working with young people that are finding it difficult to, to, to get into a career, get into career pathways, the partnership that Darlene was talking about is instrumental, it's essential, it's vital to be able to work with public sector, private sector, academic institutions, as well as nonprofit groups that are doing wonderful work. We've got to, it's an all hands on deck effort uh, to make sure that we're doing the right thing to connect what, what Secretary Perez was talking about, connecting uh, those that are looking for a job with employers that are looking for the right talent. The U.S. Chamber has done a wonderful job in making sure that we're, pro we're promoting talent pipeline management as a concept. Uh, long gone are the days where we can just hope that the academic institutions are turning out the right skills and, and talent. Those days are long gone. Today we have to make sure that we're operating lean and mean, that we are a well-honed machine, and that we are looking to business to provide uh, the workforce system with the information that they need in terms of their requirements, in terms of the skills and credentials that they're looking for, and the public sector and, and academic institutions need to be listening every single minute to make sure that they're delivering that talent requirement that's coming from the private sector. 
partnerships are key, and we're making it happen at the local level, at the regional level, at the state level, and with the help of the U.S. Chamber at the national level, I'm convinced that we can get there. Great lead-in into my closing, which is uh, to uh, just once again plug our white paper, because it is businesses' involvement that can really drive the kind of success we're looking for in terms of enhancing youth employment. On page 22, our employer checklist, if you're working with employers, you are an employer. The five essential elements, connect your youth employment strategy to your business strategy. Find the right partner to source, source youth talent. Review your policies that pose barriers in your own company to youth hiring. Prioritize soft skills development and measure and continuously improve your youth employment strategy. Together, partnering, we can finally get our hands around youth employment and start to see the kind of growth and opportunity for young people uh, that, uh, that we want in this country. Thank you for being so attentive. We appreciate it. Thank you.